Hello, my name is Judy Moore, and this is a recording of the presentation that I gave at the PC Symposium in Athens in September 2023. Okay, so the presentation is called Discovering a New Universe for ourselves beyond voices that affirm or deny spirituality in the person-centered approach. So much of our most meaningful experience as human beings happens at a pre-verbal bodily sense level. How do we give attention to these movements, sensings, knowings that have no obvious voice? What might the person-centered world gain from being open to a more expansive view of the person. This is a very short presentation and I have to make assertions that I want to make clear are based on decades of experience in the person-centered approach and very detailed examination of the material. What I'm going to look at is how the person-centered approach deals with a particular area of pre-verbal often bodily sensed experiencing that is hard to put into words, i.e. the spiritual. So here are some definitions um, from the Oxford English Dictionary. So definitions of the spiritual, the transcendent and the ineffable. And as you can see, they all point to experiencing before words. Towards the end of his life, Rogers attempted to describe his own experience of a meaningful something more. And this is what he says. I am compelled to believe that I, like many others, have underestimated the importance of this mystical spiritual dimension. For many years, mainly in the 1990s and the early 2000s, I was involved in a person-centered training that deliberately acknowledged and encouraged exploration of our spiritual dimension as human beings. This meant accepting in ourselves and others all the irrationalities and incomprehensibilities of our experiencing as we engaged with edges of awareness that somehow inexplicably felt meaningful. Being together in this way would often lead to a collective sense of awe and wonder, including a sense of the group itself as a place of great nourishment and healing. Being well versed in later Rogers, I simply took these experiences for granted and understood acknowledgement of the mystical spiritual dimension as integral to the person-centered approach. But this is not a universally held view. Indeed, it has become clear to me that there have been significant and deliberate moves over the past 30 years or so to make the person-centered approach more secular than I believe it should be. As I began to investigate this issue while writing a chapter on spirituality and the transcendence uh, for the third edition of the Handbook of Person-Centered Psychotherapy and Counseling to be published in 2024, I began to discover evidence of the writing out of spirituality from our understanding of the person. I was trained on one of the very first person-centered trainings in the UK and have borne witness to the creation and sometimes the abandonment of certain concepts, for example, the organismic self. The writing out of spirituality is yet another example of how the approach has been shaped by those who have interpreted and represented the original client-centered theory since the death of Carl Rogers in 1987. 
from my own experiencing, I believe, indeed, I know that the spiritual, whatever it is, exists in us and has huge implications for how we view ourselves as human beings. And yet the assertion or the denial of spirituality has become another manifestation of the culture wars that have beset us since the death of Rogers. Um, the assertion of such widely differing views of the person has become part of a battle over the heart of the approach. Rogers himself anticipated a split in response to his assertion of the spiritual. And he follows his sentence that, that we saw earlier about the mystical spiritual dimension by saying, here many readers I am sure will part company with me. What they will wish to know has become of logic, science of hard headedness. These two statements represent an apparent paradox that Rogers sought to reconcile, especially over the last decade of his life. But they also set the scene for a painful rupture, one of many painful and destructive ruptures that continues to be played out today. Who owns the person-centered approach in 2023 and who will determine its future direction? So, Carl Rogers and the spiritual. A commonly held view is that Carl Rogers rejected Christianity in his youth and found a different kind of spirituality in old age. My own perspective, which I put forward in my chapter in the forthcoming handbook, is that Rogers' whole life was a spiritual journey characterized by a relentless search for truth. He rejected the evangelical Christianity of his parents precisely because it was unreflective and unquestioning. As we can see from the China Diary, an account of his visit to China at the age of 20, and his diaries right up to the end of his life, Rogers examined his own reactions and inner responses with unremitting honesty. In his later years, after his move to California, and surrounded by a different peer group than his earlier research colleagues, he had more time and space to read widely on topics around the edges of human experiencing that genuinely engaged and intrigued him. He also explored scientific ideas that might give confirmation of his experience of an expansive inner world that was intimately connected with his sense of life on this planet in an expanding universe. And I offer here uh, on this slide, a brief glance at a handful of the vast number of thinkers whose works Rogers read in the final decade of his life. He also learned about Eastern religions, practiced meditation and yoga, made notes of his dreams and attended seances. In other words, he was open to practices as well as to reading that would disrupt his own received view of the world. And I have no doubt that he would have been up for some of the exercises that Nikos and I might have offered had we done a workshop on this topic instead of offering um, separate presentations. I propose that Rogers became increasingly open to the incomprehensible, the ineffable, the spiritual, precisely because he spent so many decades of his life engaged in researching the phenomena of human experiencing, including his own. Shortly after his 79th birthday, he wrote in his diary that he sensed, I am part of the divine, that God is in me is struggling in me to be in the world. And this, um, as you can see, recalls the Gnostic position, um, which is basically saying that self-knowledge uh, at the deepest level is to, is to know God. <clears throat> 
Roger's conclusions in his later published writings were tentative and exploratory, but indicative of an ever-expanding awareness. In a, in a late essay entitled, uh, I'm just going to move myself there, in a, um, yeah, in a late essay entitled, Do We Need a Reality? He makes the point that our organisms as a whole have a wisdom and a purposiveness which goes well beyond our conscious thought. Acknowledging the diversity of human beings, he also points out that we each inhabit different realities. So if we accept as a basic fact of all human life that we live in separate realities, if we can see those differing realities as the most promising resource for learning in all the history of the world, if we can live together to learn from one another without fear, if we can do all this, then a new age could be dawning. And I think that this is something that the person-centered approach in an increasingly self-destructive world needs to take very seriously. But for now, just back to culture wars um, since the death of Rogers. Much that has given shape to what we understand to be the person-centered approach since the death of Rogers in 1987 has been interpretation. Is everything that calls itself person-centered since Rogers' death simply a gathering of interpretations and opinions that remove us further and further from the carefully researched discoveries and idealism of the original client-centered therapy? and a very clear example of the damage that's been done since 1987 is the exclusion of focusing in countries like the UK, where adherence to very purest principles of non-directivity and a failure to separate the practice of focusing from understanding of the experiential response means that a narrowed version of the person-centered approach is still being taught in some training centers to this day. Polarization around the issue of spirituality has been damaging in a different way. Those who wish to affirm the importance of this mystical spiritual dimension have sought to develop arguments to strengthen their position. For example, by turning the formative tendency originally uh, postulated by Rogers as a, as a hypothesis into a concept, something to be learned or ridiculed rather than tentatively explored. More concerningly, others have written powerfully about their own spiritual experiences, which may open up new understanding or insights, but have also had damaging effects. For example, my former colleague Brian Thorne's writings, and especially his pronouncements on the connection between sexuality and spirituality, I know for a fact have been used by some therapists to justify the exploitation of vulnerable clients. So unfortunately, recognition of such danger in the work of a leading figure in the person-centered world has probably ironically strengthened moves to secularize the approach, which I think is very sad because we lose masses as a result of this. So what are a couple of examples of these um, secularizations? Therapeutic presence is one. Um, and in their work on presence, um, Shari Geller and Les Greenberg acknowledge the original quote from Rogers, which I give here in the slide, um, but they don't give its broader context because this uh, Rogers statement comes in the middle of a section on altered states of consciousness, literally a page before he talks about underestimating the importance of this mystical spiritual dimension. Rogers made an observation 
which is simply my presence is releasing, but for later generations, presence has become a secularized concept, something valuable as it is uh, to be taught and learned. Relational depth is another secularization. Um, another concept that many have found useful, but like presence, it has been abstracted and developed in a particular way from its more speculative origins. A key figure in this particular development has been Dave Merns. In 1994, he wrote this, if Rogers and I are talking about the same experience of presence, then I would suggest that it might be referred to in mystical language, or in terms of existing concepts, whichever is the writer's preference. I suspect that we could go a long way towards describing this phenomenon by considering it as a combination of two circumstances. First, there is a blending together of high degrees of the three core conditions of empathy, unconditional positive regard and congruence. In conceptual terms, these three concepts come close together when we look at their extremes, particularly empathy and congruence. And very interestingly, the, the late Paul Wilkins regarded this particular statement as having been instrumental in leading man's to develop the idea of working at relational depth. And of course, the concept of relational depth has been carried forward um, since then by Mick Cooper and others. Okay, so in conclusion, where are we now? We do still hear the ever fainter cries of those who acknowledge that the human being has a spiritual dimension. But my impression is that the loudest and most influential voices of, are those who have chosen to sideline spirituality from the person-centered approach. As long as we continue, for example, to accept presence and relational depth as concepts isolated from their original context, the voices and influence of logic, of science, of hard-headedness, to use Roger's words, continue to be all pervasive. So, picking up on the theme of the symposium, there is no real polyphony in this. Do we favour listening to those who promote new secularised concepts over listening with greater openness to late Rogers, or, more simply and possibly more challengingly, to listening to the incomprehensible edges of our own human existence? Have we simply allowed ourselves since the death of Rogers to be seduced by false gods? What might we gain by staying with the truth of our own experiencing, however bizarre or irrational it may be? And um, this is a, uh, this is um, an extract from Roger's essay, another late essay, The World and the Person of Tomorrow. This person of tomorrow has hitherto undreamt of potential. This person's non-conscious intelligence is vastly capable. It, control, it can control many bodily functions, can heal diseases, can create new realities. This person has a new awareness of his or her strength, abilities and power, an awareness of self as a process of change. This person lives in a new universe where all the familiar concepts have disappeared. Time, space, object, matter, cause, effect. Nothing remains but vibrating energy. So basically, Roger's tomorrow at the beginning of the 1980s is our today. I believe that like Carl Rogers, we need to find our own path and be prepared to allow all that is familiar, including all that is familiar in what has become a very narrowed theory 
to be disrupted. We stand in danger of disempowering ourselves if we give too much authority to others in this area. We can only be enriched, not just as therapists, but as human beings by being non-defensively open to different realities and especially to that which is beyond our comprehension. So, thank you. And I have here some um, some of the main references that I've that I've used. <clears throat>